Hey everybody, in this video we're going to cover a double repeated measures design. This web opens a data set that I have that says RM2 ANOVA. Now this data set I use for both repeated measures, um, two-way repeated measures, and mixed design. So the first thing we're going to do is get rid of columns that we don't need specifically for this design. So I'm going to save this as a regular Excel file. Save it as XLS. And specifically, we're going to leave it as repeated measures ANOVA underscore data screening. Remember, that allows us to have uh, multiple tabs. So I'm going to get rid of these last two columns here because those are for the mixed design and this first column as well. Now, the subject column is literally a subject number, and you don't really need it. Um, you can hang on to it if you'd like, but for using Excel and JASP, I don't really need it. So I'm going to delete these two. So I'm only looking at the data that I need for this particular analysis. And so going back over some sort of repeated measures issues here. So let's open, I have a Word doc here, it is. Oops, that's repeated measures one, my fault. Will we wait on Word to open? I'm going to close that one. Here we go. So I closed the wrong one, I think. Ack! I'm just like a closing crazy person. So you come here for the stats, you stay for the goofy goofiness. There we go. Repeat measures two. <clears throat> there we go. All right. So with repeated measures design, we don't have to do this. Um, uh, first note that I had there, and that's specific to R. So in talking about this for just Excel and JASP, it is very tempting to view this as one independent variable. And so what I mean by that is if I look across all four of these here, it's tempting to think that this is one repeated measures variable with four levels. And that would ignore the fact that this is structured in a hierarchical way, meaning there are two independent variables, um, but they're both repeated. So this is some of the research that I do looking at how people are able to judge the relationship between two items. So we give them things like cheese and cheddar and we ask them how many times out of 100, if I said cheese, would the next word out of someone's mouth be cheddar? It's very similar to family, similar to family feud, except it's a guess of the number and not a guess of the word. Um, and what we're able to show with this is that people are particularly bad at it. Um, and so what we do is we vary two different variables. So come, let's scroll down just a little bit here and look at what the data file has. So FSG is forward strength or how strong the relationship is forward. So lost to found is very strong. Okay. There are two levels that we'll use, low and high. Backward strength, on the other hand, is how strong the relationship is the other way because they're not the same in each direction. So if I said found, how many people would say lost? Okay. Now cheese to cheddar is actually pretty low because most people say mouse to cheese. Um, but cheddar to cheese is very high. So we can make these relationships a, um, a two by two, meaning low, 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 high, high, low, and high, high. So that creates four conditions. And so it's a two by two, meaning there's two levels of each independent variable, and that creates two times two, four different combinations. Now everyone sees all four types of these combinations, and that's what makes it a double repeated measures design is that of two IVs, um, and each one has two levels, and I see all four of those conditions. Okay. So it's very tempting to, to test this as just one IV, um, but that would be ignoring the interaction between variables. And so um, what we want to do is just make sure that we treat them as two separate variables. So we're going to check out those main effects. How much does the matter for forward and backward strength ignoring the effect of the other variable? And in this particular case, our main effects will tell me if participants can even tell if there's a difference between low and high strengths. So if we're really bad at this task and we can't even discern that some of them aren't related and some of them are related, that's, that's a problem, right? Now for the interaction, what we're doing is seeing if that backward strength is what we're really interested in, creates a different effect than 
um, having just forward strength. So we're trying to see if the pattern across those levels is different for our different strengths of so backward strength given forward strength. Okay. So we're going to, uh, this is a, a similar chart to the one you saw in double between subjects. And so it's just a way to think about interpreting the means. Now here we can do Bonferroni or we can do Tutti um, because we have that option in JASP. Um, Tutti is a lot harder in R. <clears throat> And we don't actually have to split anything. That's the great part about JASP. Uh, so what we can do, if I have a main effect and there's more than two levels, I would have to run a dependent T with some sort of correction. And that means if I had like four or five levels, I would need to do something. Here, if there's a main effect and there's only two levels, I just interpret the means. So remember when there are, and I'm trying to interpret the main effects and there are only two levels, don't run a t-test because then you're repeating yourself. So with main effects, we are looking at just one IV um, and there are only two levels. It's a special case where you just interpret the means. Because remember, an ANOVA and a t-test with only two levels are the same thing. Um, now, I would do the same thing for the other main effects. So these two columns are the same, but we're still going to have two main effects. Now for the interaction, we do have to split on one IV. Now it said that here and I deleted it. Um, and I don't want to, you don't have to split the data set like you do with between subjects. So remember in between subjects video, it was kind of a pain because we had to take that data set and we had to split it into different pieces. But here we sort of have to split, um, split manually uh, by creating, by looking at the columns. I don't know a good way to put this. You'll see as we go. It's not even really splitting manually. What's a good word here? Split interpretation wise, split. Hmm. We'll just kind of do this. It's kind of a split. It is not a literal split of the data set like we had to do for between subjects. Okay. Now, if the interaction is significant, same rules as before, people often ignore those main effects because it will reduce type one error and you're interested in the interaction anyway, so why would you run those main effects? So that's what's going on with some little edits to focus in here on JASP and Excel. And so we're going to give people a whole bunch of word pairs related for their relatedness. And um, how many times out of 100 would people put those two words together? So remember, this is family feud in reverse. Um, we'll talk about power at the end. And so we're going to get started here. I'm going to scroll down to the very, very bottom. And we will input in our information here and then talk about how to write this up. So let us insert page break. And then when we get back to this point, we'll come back to this document. Now, I've got my Excel file. And what I really want to do is edit away to find any um, of my assumptions that I need to fix. So remember, this is our master data set. And let's copy this over and check out anything for typos. So we're going to start with the no typos data set. I'm going to copy this again. Although we might, thank you Excel for being so helpful, we might not end up fixing anything. So let's see if we have any typos. Now these are averages. Participants did not list 20.75. What we did was we created averages of their words. Um, so for this condition, low, low, um, this first participant gave us an average score of 20.75 across all the word pairs they saw. Now if I wanted to analyze this individually by each word pair, I would have to do a multi-level model, okay. um, which you cannot do in Excel. Um, and so these are just average scores. So decimals are okay. So otherwise I need to check my minimum max and I need to check any categorical columns. In this particular case, in a double repeated measures or an all way repeated measures design, you're not gonna have any categorical columns because everything is sort of stored as a separate column. Because remember each participant gets their own row. And so that means each condition that they saw gets its own column which to me is the trickiest part about using wide format data because it's hard sometimes to remember that these are not separate dependent variables. It's the dependent variable is the rating that they gave 
An independent variable is which group they gave the rating to, or which level or condition. And so the, um, the trickiest part for repeated measures for students in using this or SPSS is often discerning the fact that um, the number is the DV here and the column name here is the condition name. All that aside, I don't have any categorical columns to fix, but I still want to check my min and max. So I'm going to click data, data analysis. We're going to use descriptive statistics. Click OK. You notice this time I managed to remember that highlighting it first does me no good. So then I'm going to highlight now. Make sure you click labels, summary statistics. Click OK. Wait for Excel to calculate here. Let's make this big. Okay. Now, my min and my max here cannot go between 0 and 100. So I can't have any negative numbers. I can't have anything over 100 because that was the range of the data that we forced it to be. And there aren't any. So these are pretty good data sets. So we don't have a lot of accuracy errors that you'll notice across these videos. Um, mostly because you don't tend to have them too often. Now, um, data sets that are hand coded or in any way manipulated from the time that you, um, let's say, collect the data through Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey or some online software, and you are then editing data, say creating averages or doing that sort of thing, that's when it really becomes important. Um, because often the software isn't going to glitch, but maybe you accidentally coded the data set from 0 to 6 and it should have been 1 to 7. Those are the things that tend to happen. So I don't really have any accuracy problems. So do I have any missing data? So I'm going to go down here and say, OK, I don't have any typos. What about no missing? And I'm relabeling this one instead of creating a new one because I didn't have any typos to begin with. So when I look at this and it goes straight to no missing, that to me implies that there were no typos to deal with. So let's see this. So equals count A. So count the number of data points here. I'm highlighting all the numbers. Close parentheses, so you can look right here and see what's happening. I'm going to divide by the total number of participants, which in this case is 158. And then if I want to make sure this is in percent, I can times that by 100. Click on this column here. Go from a white plus to a black plus. Drag across here. So I don't have any missing data either uh, because these are averages. So no missing data. No typos. So let's now go on to no outliers. Now in the original data screening data set, what we did was we created an average score because we had like 20 or 30 columns. In this particular data set, I only have four columns. So I'm going to look at each one of those separately. So I've got Z of my low, low condition, Z of my high, low condition. So I'm looking here at the names, so low, high. Z of my low high condition and Z of my high high condition. To calculate our Z score, we're going to do equals, uh, open parentheses, click on that first data point, minus, type the word average, open parentheses, click on that column, close parentheses, Close one more time, divided by STDEV, open parentheses, click on that first column again, close parentheses. Okay. Make sure you get all those parentheses in the right place, um, otherwise the, your Z scores will look crazy. Okay. So this first person's score is pretty low. It's not an outlier, but it's pretty low. Remember the gloriousness of Excel, so I'm going to click on this one here and go from the white plus to a black plus, and I'm going to drag this way. And that will fill in the, um, the data, uh, the, sorry, the z-score formula going across. So this one is for column B. Here, if I click here, I can see this is all column C. Click here, I can see this is all column D. Now right away I can see I have an outlier for column D. And this participant's scores are pretty far out there. They're at negative 2, almost negative 3, and then past negative 3. So we'll think about what to do with them in a minute. 
I'm gonna highlight all four rows or columns. Go from the white plus to the black plus, double click, and that will fill in all of the Z scores for all of the participants because I don't have any missing data. So if you have a missing point here, it'll stop filling for you. Now this is a lot of data sets to like sort and sort and sort and sort. So we're gonna highlight these four and just get it to color it for us. So click home, conditional formatting, highlight cell rules. Let's go greater than 2.99. So we'll get any of the threes. One more time, conditional formatting, highlight cell rules, less than negative 2.99. Okay, and now we can see a little better where our outliers are. So there were those two at the top. If I scroll, 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 I don't have any other ones. So only these two people up here who have two outliers on the last condition. So they've just picked low numbers going across. So why are these guys outliers? Um, and hopefully in your own research, this will be clear why they're outliers. Uh, in my, you know, in my data sets, it may not make a whole lot of sense. Um, but given that I know that people tend to have very high scores on this, they tend to guess at the 50% range no matter what, uh, and they tend to be uh, very biased, I can tell that these are outliers because their scores are really low. Um, and so what, what would I do here? Well, more than likely, um, they just bias their scores down. They just guessed everything low. And I can decide if I think that that is appropriate to leave them in because they weren't probably screwing around. They were probably trying to do the instructions. So it kind of is uh, like mm, what I want to do here. Um, and given that their scores are high all the way across, what I'm probably going to do is delete them. So we could say this one here is our no missing data set. And here, oops, ack, I'm sorry, let's leave this one alone. So this is no outliers. In my final data set, I want to delete those two people. Okay, so we want to get rid of those two. Just because their z-scores are way too high. Now that is going to change all of the z-scores on over here um, because now it's going to divide by a slightly different mean and standard deviation because I deleted those two people. Okay. Do not double delete people. I think in one of my previous videos I talked about this a little bit, but over here in the master data set you could keep notes to yourself. So no accuracy issues. No missing data. Two outliers. And so I can kind of keep track of what I've done to the data set. So that's perfectly fine. This Excel file is really meant to keep track of your data screening process. Okay. All right, taking that final data set, let's check our assumptions. So remember the assumptions for repeated measures uh, ANOVA for correlations is a little different than the like overall data screening procedures. So I'm going to click on data analysis and go up to correlation. Okay. Um, to get there quickly, I just typed C. I'll say OK. Correlation, I'm going to highlight all four columns. Labels in the first row. And it can give me a new worksheet. So this is the assumption of additivity. Where we want each variable to add something to what we're doing. And remember, the rules for repeated measures ANOVA are 0.99. Basically, it cannot be one. Now, in this case, remember that these ones here are supposed to be there. That's it correlated with itself. If you have a very big data set, you could do these highlight rules that we did before. So click Home, Conditional Formatting, Highlight Rules, Greater Than, and you just do 0.99. If I can find the nine on my keyboard. And it turns out that we don't have any problems. Now, yes, they're very highly correlated, but that's because it's the same person doing it over and over again. And that's actually a good thing for us. 
because then we can get rid of the variance that's due to the fact that people are the same people over and over again. So we talk a lot about good variance versus bad variance in this class. And good variance is the differences between conditions because that's what we're manipulating in this experiment. Bad variance is the participant stuff where you can't control the fact that participant A is different from participant B in some way, but I can control the fact that participant A is participant A all four times. So that's the nice thing about double repeated measures um, is that I can control for what I sometimes call participantness or subjectness, which is the variance due to the fact that participants are the same participants over and over again. That reduces error variance or bad variance because now I understand that participant A is just lower than everybody else. But back to additivity. I don't have any additivity problems um, because nothing is over 0.99. Essentially, it cannot be one or the math will not run. To get the rest of my assumptions, I'm going to create that random variable. So equals rand, open, close, parentheses. Go from white plus to black plus, double click. And that'll give me a random number to work with here. So I'm going to click on data for data screening, data analysis. Remember, we're doing a fake regression, so we're going to go down here to regression. Click OK. Our Y is our random variable. Our X here are all four of our IV variables. So I'm highlighting all four of everything. I ignored the labels in this case since my Excel does not like that for some reason. I would like to see standardized residuals, residual plots, and normal probability plots. And then we'll leave it on the new worksheet. We'll hit OK. And hope this doesn't take forever. Wow, that was quick. Depends on the day, I guess. Whoa, too big. Scroll out. Okay. All right. Remember, we don't really want to look at any of this stuff because we're not actually using this as real, real regression. Later, it will be part of the real regression, so we don't really want to use it right now, though. And we're really interested in this data stuff down here. Okay. We've talked about doing um, uh, a histogram in a slightly different way than what we get up here or the, then, then I showed you in the data screening video, rather, sorry, um, just because it, this tends to work a little better. So we're gonna create some fake bins, and I've just been doing negative two, 1.5, 1 .5, negative one, negative 0.5, zero. Um, sometimes you can drag and drop where Excel figures out what you're doing. So I highlighted all of this, got to the black arrow plus, and um, dragged it down. Sometimes it just kind of fills it in with like ones and so it depends on what Excel feels like doing. But I've created my bins here. Um, what that's going to do is force the x-axis to be something that we're familiar with. Let's click data, data analysis, histogram, click OK. Our input range is the standardized residuals down here. So I want all of those. Our bin range is this new bin thing that we created, wherever it went. Um, I would like to get my chart. I'm going to click on the output range here. Click, tell it to just kind of go right here. always sticks the chart in some place that you aren't expecting, so come down here. Okay. Remember that this histogram is a little better than the other histogram that we talked about in the other data screening videos because I have control over the bottom here. So is the data centered around zero? Yeah. So between two and two? Yeah. Is it great that it makes this weird little dip right here? Mm, no. But I would say this is pretty normal. Okay. And I have at least 30 people. So what we don't want to see is data that runs um, like 0 to negative 4, 1 to 4, um, and then or is very lopsided. So if there were a lot more data points on one side than the other. So this looks pretty good. Okay, so that's normality. For linearity, we're going to look at this normal probability plot. 
I'm just going to kind of move it over here so all these plots aren't on top of each other. And that's looking pretty good, but remember I can right click and add a trend line just so I can see a little better if these dots line up in a straight line or if they're kind of curvy. And I can't even see the trend line. This is so nice and linear. So this is pretty good. Other thing we're going to get here is we actually get one for each variable. So I could look at each variable plot one at a time. So I don't have to kind of move them around to make sure that they're centered across zero. So let's look at variable four here. And so here's zero. And then sort of here's the middle of the data set. Um, and is that centered from around zero this way and sort of the middle horizontally? And I'd say, yeah. So that's probably um, homogeneous or it passes the homogeneity assumption. And then is it nice and square? Oh, hell yeah. Look how pretty this graph is. It's uh, also homoscedastic, meaning that the spread is the same all the way down X. I could do that for each one. Or remember, we can actually create our own of the entire data set all at once. Um, so to do that, what we kind of have to do is take all of this information here. I'm going to paste it down here. And I'm just going to get rid of this residuals column. So there's a lot of restructuring here. But I got predicted Y and standardized residuals. Those are the two columns I'm interested in. I actually did not ask for this residuals column, but it gives it to me anyway. I'm going to click on, I'm going to actually, just kidding, going to highlight them first. Click on insert. And it's actually a scatter plot. And this will be a scatter plot of all of the residuals for both, for all the variables at once, so all four. Okay. So is it centered around zero? Yeah, that's pretty good, pretty good. Is it centered around the middle? So we didn't standardize um, this predictive Y, so we just kind of have to find the middle here. And I'd say, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty even. Um, so I would say this is homogeneous, so the variances are roughly equal. Now for Heteroscedasticity or homoscedasticity, I want a nice even spread all the way across. And it's starting to look like a little bit like a fish, right? So this, the fact that it comes to a point over here is not the best, but it's also not the worst because really that point is caused by a couple of dots right here. So I would say that this graph is probably okay. Now remember, we're creating these graphs using a random number. And so while the plot, the really bad plots aren't really going to change if you do the random number, a couple of little dots here and there is not something to freak out about um, because that might just be because of the random numbers that we picked. So we just have to kind of be careful of like saying, oh, this is bad because there's one dot here and there's no dots down here. It's starting to be bad because it's starting to make this triangle shape. And if I was really nervous about it, what I'd actually do is conveniently I have all four variables up here is I would start to look at each variable separately and see if maybe it's one variable or another. Um, good grief little dog. So sneezing brought to you by small beagle dog. Right. And it might be because um, this plot has one little extra way dot way out here. So it might be this one dot, this one person and this one point because the rest of these look great. Like they're nice and evenly spread. Um, and so that's what I was saying. Just be careful when you're interpreting these graphs. Don't be too mean to them, I guess would be what I would say. Um, wherever the graph went. Uh, I guess it's down here. I've lost my scatter plot. <laughs> wherever that scatter plot went, don't be too mean to it is all I would say. Okay. So here we're checking our assumptions. So what do we end up doing with this data set? Well, we didn't have any accuracy issues. We didn't have any missing data. We deleted two people based on outliers because their z-scores had two outliers and the rest of the z-scores were really high. Additivity was okay. Uh, normality is okay. Homogeneity, oh, sorry, linearity is what we did next, is okay. Homogeneity is okay. Homoscedasticity is okay. So we're doing pretty good. What now? Now we need, really need to check for sporicity and we'll do that in JASP, and then we can run our analysis. So I'm gonna take my final data set here since I did do some stuff to it. 
copy that, create a new data set, and save that. We're going to come down here and save that as a CSV file. And I might call this final just so it's clear. So you're going to end up with a bunch of like tabs and a bunch of data sets. And that's okay because that, I promise you, helps um, helps you remember what you did later. So if this were a real analysis and let's say send it off for publication and a reviewer says, well, you didn't explain how you did X clearly. You can go back and you have these things saved or typed out or written up. Um, and you learn that lesson, unfortunately, the hard way sometimes. And so uh, take it from me and from my advisor, be more descriptive in how you save files and the notes you take to yourself so that later, six, six months, a year, a year and a half later, when you get a review from someone, you can remember what you did. All right, so I'm not gonna save that one because remember it does funny things for CSVs. I am gonna save this one and I'm just gonna kind of get rid of, get rid of Excel. Um, uh, sure, save. So let's go to JASP here. Okay, so now we're actually gonna run the analysis and we're gonna check for sporicity. So I'm gonna click on file. Oops, computer, sorry. For me, it's hidden in this Nova folder. And we're specifically using the final copy here. So I've got my four columns and I know it's the right data set because I only have 156 people instead of 158. Let's click on ANOVA, repeated measures ANOVA. And so my first factor here, I'm just going to click on it and give it a better name. We're going to call this forward strength just so it's clear in the output over here what I'm actually measuring. I'm going to create a second one called that backward strength. And under the levels, I can actually change the names of the levels. So low and high and low. Whoopee, I hit the button somewhere and high. What does that do for me? Relabeling everything. That's not what I wanted. I wanted this to get bigger. Well, it's about as big as it'll get apparently. What that does is it allows me to see what's happening here. Now, since I have the same names here, what I might do is call this F low or flow, not on purpose, that's not funny, I'm, I don't know a reason for a reason, and be low or blow and be high, just so I can see what the heck it's doing down here. And the reason that's useful is not only does it give me useful names over here, but it also helps me figure out which one to put where. So one of the biggest things that you can do, I hate to say incorrectly, but the things that you could do that would screw up your interpretation of this analysis, and this is true for SPSS as well, is fiddling them in in the wrong places. So it does assume that this is the cell that you're giving it. So I'm going to find forward strength low, backward strength low. And by labeling them, I have that name here, FSG low, BSG low. I know I'm sticking the right cell in the right box here. Now this is forward strength low, backward strength high. So that's actually this one here. Forward strength high, backward strength low. And F high, B high, so high, high. And that made it much easier by labeling them instead of level one, level two, level one. If you leave them alone, it'll say level one, level one, and level one, level two, and that gets confusing. So give yourself descriptive names here. It automatically gave us a bunch of stuff over here that's gonna be really helpful in a minute. But right now I'm concerned about sporicity, so I'm gonna click assumption checks, click sporicity tests. I can actually do homogeneity tests as well, but that's when you have a mixed design, so it tells me you didn't give me enough information here, so I'm gonna turn that off. And what you'll see is that I got a whole bunch of NANs. Okay. And that means not a number. So something happened here. I don't have, I didn't get my sporicity test. Well, why not? And the nice thing about um, JASP here is it actually tells you why. And so this is always a quiz question. I love to ask this question, so write it down. Um, why, why don't you see Mockley's test when you only have two levels? Okay. And so it says right here very clearly, the repeated measure only has two levels. When the repeated measure has two levels, the assumption of sparsity is always met. 
So back up, what is sporicity again? Well, sporicity is the assumption that the correlations between levels are the same. And when I only have two, that has to be met because I have correlation from one to two and I have no other correlation to be run. And then the, cor the question is that the uh, variance uh, difference, differences in variances between levels are the same. So take level one minus level two and compare that variance to level one minus level three. But I don't have a level three here. So with only two levels, sporicity doesn't occur because you just can't test that assumption. So I love to ask this question. Be sure you write it down for the quiz. Why, why do you not get Mockley's if there's only two levels? And that's because you, can, you cannot test for sporicity with only two levels or essentially that the assumptions always met. So sporicity isn't a question here. All right, all of that's data screening. Data screening done. Let's talk about the main analysis now. So some other things I want to add, click on additional options. Just be sure to give me my effect sizes. I also like to ask for descriptive so I get the means and standard deviations. So here are my effect sizes over here. You can tell this is made up data. This is a real research project that we worked on, but it's clearly made up data because look how beautifully large these eta squares are. And what do I want to do? I want to know if there is a significant difference between low and high forward strength, because if they can't tell the difference between low and high, the experiment is kind of a bust. And that is significant. It only has two levels. So I just am going to go down here and look at low and high. But these are condition means. So let's see if I can get it to give me, I don't know if I can, descriptive plus. So one bad thing about um, JASP here is that I can't get it to give me my marginal means for repeated measures. Maybe I can? Nope. So I would have to kind of create these means on my own. Um, so I guess we can't. I thought you could, but apparently not. Uh, let's see if I can force it to give it to me by doing this. I can get it to give me the mean difference, but that's not super helpful either. Okay, so let's not look at those because I don't want you to think you're supposed to do that. Anyway, so are there differences between low and high forward strength? Yes, clearly this p-value is significant, right? It's less than 0.05. Now, low and high forward strength, I would have to kind of average these two, right? Because low here, it's broken down into the two combinations. But it's about 53 points if I average 50 and 56. Versus 64, average was 78. A number. It is a number. Add four. It's about 70 something. Don't, I'm not good at math. I'm good at stats, I'm not good at math, which is a lie, I'm actually good at math. I just can't do math in my head anymore because cell phones have ruined me. But anyways, so it's 50 is lower than the 60s and 70s. That's my interpretation. So FSG, there's a significant difference between those two conditions, those two levels. Now for BSG here, there's also a difference between the levels. I gotta kinda maneuver this one. So I got 50 and 64, right, so that's a, uh, average together. So we could say 50 plus 64 is 114. 114 divided by 2 is 57 points, okay, about. And then I've got 56 and 78. Okay, 134. Or you can ask Siri what these are, which is what I do a lot. So it's 67 points. So I got about 57 points for low and 67 points for high. So that's the difference there. Okay. Now in this particular experiment, that shouldn't happen. If people were any good at this task, they would not have a difference between those two. But given that I've done a, a bunch of these studies, I'm not surprised that there is a difference between those two conditions. Levels, levels. Sorry, we're talking about main effects. Okay. Um, but in those two particular cases, that all is qualified by the fact that there is an interaction. So there's clearly a forward strength to a backward strength interaction here. So I see it right here in my 0.01. And that tells me that the combination of these means is different. And I think you'll be able to see this better when we make a graph of what's happening. But we could also get a plot here 
just a temporary plot if I just want to kind of look at what's happening. Yeah, let's ask for error bars here. So what is happening? So the low one here is lower than the high one. Okay. And that is the difference between backward strength, that the low is lower than high. Forward strength, the low is lower than high. So those are the two main effects. But what's happening, and they're kind of jittered so that they're not right on top of each other. They're not, it's like, it doesn't, isn't actually, you know, like here. They're just made so that they're not um, right on top of each other. What's happening here is the difference here is kind of small and the difference here is bigger than that. Okay. I'm not so concerned that the difference here is not the same. I want to compare them where I'm looking at the differences between these two and these two. Okay. And what that's telling me here is that at low forward strengths, um, that high backward strength kicks it up a little bit. So think about this like a, like a food, like the Emerald Show, where it kick it up a notch, right? So this creates a, a higher rating here. But a high forward strength, it's even bigger of a rating. So we're, um, we're kicking it up even more. It's way too spicy at this level. Okay? And that is important because it allows us to see how memory is affecting um, our ratings of these things. And if backward strength didn't matter, you wouldn't get the interaction and you wouldn't see that this one here is closer and this one here is farther away. That's my prediction. At the moment, I haven't tested anything. Okay. And so here is where we get into doing post hoc tests for interactions. Okay. And we'll talk about how to write all this up here in a second when I copy it into Word. Okay. I can't use this post hoc box because this will only do the main effects. And so I was trying to see if it would show me the means, but I, I didn't want you to turn that on thinking that it was um, important, like I needed it. So when we go to do write-ups, you don't need that information because there's only two levels. Okay, and I don't want to run a test twice. And so what I'm going to have to do here is click OK. And I'm going to have to do this uh, comparison manually. Now, I was talking about splitting at the beginning. And it's not really splitting um, like we have to split the data file for between subjects. Because remember, we had to create like five different data files. But here, I'm going to split, so to speak, and make sure I'm comparing the groups I'm interested in. So I'm going to keep this graph here, even though I can't really use this for publication purposes. This little graph will show me. I want to do um, four forward strength low or flow. I want to compare my backward strengths. Four forward strength high. I want to compare my backward strengths. Okay. So I'm going to click on t-tests, and then we'll make that chart like we've been doing. Click paired samples t-tests. I just want to make sure I get my combinations right here. So for my two low forward strengths, so I'm going to select those two. I want to compare BSG low to FSG high, BSG high. So what I'm doing is I'm holding forward strength constant. They're both low. And I want to look at low versus high. So I'm comparing these two dots to each other. Now I want to do the exact same thing, um, but for high. So forward strength high, I'm going to compare low to high. Okay. Now I could flip this and do it the other way. I, the only thing I don't want to do really is compare like this dot to that dot. So I don't know, it makes a whole lot of sense to compare this combination to that combination. And remember, this isn't a cross or down question. So we talked about this before for our between subjects. Well, let me just kind of make you another cross here. So this would be um, low versus high. And this side's forward strength. So let me make this super clear here. Merge FSG, right? And this is low and high again. And merge and BSG. Okay. Now, this when would this sort of scenario happen? Might might it happen? Let's say that you have um, two different drugs and you're trying to look at their interaction, and you give some patients low dosages and some patients high dosages. Obviously, you want this to be safe because you don't want to kill patients, but um, this might be like drug one and drug two, where you have low and high. Or this might be two different exercises that you're having people try in low intensities and high intensities. So it might be that you need a low intensity of exercise one and a high intensity of exercise two to really get the best combination of caloric burn or like stretching or whatever your DV is. But if you had high intensity on both of them, you might have an injury. So just another example of like how this might be applied to what you might be doing. 
um, instead of thinking about this as like memory example. Okay. All right, so what that does is it creates this low, low combination, this low, high combination, this high, low combination. Come on, go away, puppy. And this high, high combination. Okay. So those were the four columns that we had. And now I can compare across or down. So remember, I could holding forward strength low, compare backward strength low to backward strength high. That's what we're gonna do. Holding it high, compare low to high. Or I could say, okay, I'm gonna take backward strength, compare low forward strength to high back forward strength, and then just high backward strength, low to high. So I can compare going this way, or I can compare going this way. Don't do both. Also, don't compare low, low to high, high. I know it's very tempting, but don't like pick random boxes. Go down or across, because that's the way the conditions are, are formatted. Okay, so let's have a very specific hypothesis. So remember, there are two rules here about splitting. Where did that came? Okay, apparently this is rule seven. So just how to split. Remember, go across or down, and then the rule is split on the higher number of levels, which will give you the smaller number of comparisons. In a square design, this doesn't matter. And that's what we have here is a square design because it's two by two, so they're the same. And the number one rule is always go with your hypothesis. But if your hypothesis doesn't predict a particular direction, then go with split on the number of levels. Okay. And that is from the Keppel and Wickens book. Okay. Um, the number one number one rule is always do what your advisor wants or your boss. Okay. Even if they change their mind three times, do what your advisor wants because that's how you graduate or keep your job. <clears throat> okay, now we've done those t-tests. And the nice thing about JASP is I can go ahead and get my effect size for that. Woo um, and we already have the descriptive, so I'm just gonna tell it to not give me anything. Copy all of this output, dump this into Word, so we can talk a little bit more about how do I write this up. That's okay. Ooh. So it really wanted me to give it permission to paste that picture. Okay, which the picture is huge, oh my goodness. <laughs> All right, so if I scroll up here, I think this is acting weird because it's in double spacing. So let me just squish that down to single space to maybe it'll work a little better. There we go. That looks a little bit more reasonable. Okay. So if I take first here, these ANOVA boxes. Now I have, weirdly enough, I have two ANOVA boxes. This between subjects effects one is the peopleness. So I said it takes out the controls for subjectness or participantness or peopleness, and we're actually not gonna use that. So in this particular box here, um, you can just sort of highlight it out. Okay. Don't use that box. So we would want to talk about forward strength. The main effect of forward strength is significant. So I would use my F here. And so that's 1 and 155 pulled from here. And then I come across here, and this is my F statistic. Remember, F can be very, very large, um, which is not unusual. If we have a large ratio, of good variance to bad variance. So think about this for two seconds. Remember that F is a ratio of good variance to bad variance, and it is 900 to one. <laughs> so this is a very big effect. I'd report my p-value is less than 0 0.001, just like they have it here. And I'm gonna copy A to square from up here. Paste that down here. And that is 0.86. Now more than likely, and I would check this, this is partial eta squared. So I'm gonna throw a little p in there to indicate that this is partial because there's more than one effect here. So this is eta squared just for this particular effect. Okay. Um, and not total eta squared because I have three effects going on. So you usually don't calculate total. 
So total eta squared is like all of the effects over the total. Whereas this, and they would add up to one. So we would be partitioning variance out, um, or not add up to one, they'd add up to less than one. Here, this is partial eta squared because it, um, it only is looking at this one partially, given that there are other things in the, the uh, design. Right? So these aren't totals, these are partials. All right, here we're gonna call, chain, do BSG, and it's one and 155. Okay. Now they're the same because um, we have a two by two, and so the, this one here is two minus one. Our F statistic is this big number, so it's a ratio of 373 to one, so that's also big. Oh, I hit the wrong button also less than 0 0.001. Our partial eta here is 0.71. Now, what these told me is there's a difference between low forward strength and high forward strength, low backward strength and high backward strength. That's great, but I'm really more interested in the interaction. It's 1 and 155 again. equals, and this ratio is 71 or 72 to 1, so still a big effect, p less than 0 0.001. Cut and paste my symbols here because I hate finding the symbols in the symbols window, and it's 0 0.32. All of these effects would be considered large. Remember, the, the rules are kind of dependent on which person you listen to, but all of them would be considered big. Um, and while these main effects are interesting, I'm more interested in the interaction. So I could talk about these main effects, but really I want to analyze that interaction. Now why, if I've been looking at the Between Subjects videos, do I get three separate residuals, right? So in Between Subjects, they all have the same uh, mean square at the bottom. And so this one looks like three little tiny ANOVAs, right? So ANOVA1, ANOVA 2 and ANOVA 3. And that's not what's happening. That's the way it looks as part of the output. Uh, but what happens is in a between subjects design, there's no peopleness to control for. And so what happens is that we take our good variance and we break it into IV1, IV2, and um, the interaction. And then all the bad variance is just the bad variance um, or the error term. In this particular, in repeated measures ANOVAs, what we do is we take that variance and we break it down into good variance for IV1 and the error for IV1, good variance for IV2 and the error for IV2. So we're breaking these up a, a little differently. And so it kind of tends to look like three little mini ANOVAs, but mathematically they're all still tied together. Um, it's just that you might get different um, errors for each one, because I have to control for the fact that participants are participants each particular time. Okay. All right, we already talked about Mockley, so we're just going to ignore it because it doesn't have anything, we can't use it. Um, and then I'm going to take these descriptives down here, and I'm just going to move them down to where we actually ran our t-tests. Paste that stuff here, just so I can see it better. There it is. It's like, or not. So what we've been doing is making these little tables. And let's see, we've got group one, group two, V1, the t-test, the effect size, and our sort of interpretation here. So I'm gonna make this table a little bigger. So I've got IV, one, and I've got group one, group two, our T here, our effect size, and then our interpretation. I did this one before in, um, just in the box, so you can kind of do this either way. There's no right or wrong way to do these particular tables as long as you have all of this information in there. And this is really for you and for your homework. Um, you wouldn't publish this sort of table. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold FSG low 
constant here. And so our first comparison is for BSG low compared to BSG high. And that's these mean standard deviations and ends. Oh, right, it won't let you copy and paste. We tried that last time. So I got 50.66 SD23. And N is actually the same all the way across, so I'm not going to put N in here. And we're comparing that to a mean of 56.34 and a standard deviation of 12.29. Fingers got ahead of myself there. So is this six point difference, or kind of five and a half point difference, significant? And yes, it is. So it's this first test here. So our degrees of freedom are 155, because it's n minus 1, and it's negative 11, 11. Why is that negative? Well, it's negative because I put the lower one first. So low to high, the subtraction is negative. And that's why I think having these means is really important. Okay, because now I can look at them just directly and go, okay, low is low and high is higher. Our effect size here is D differences. Remember there are several different types of effect size for uh, repeated measures, so it's helpful if you tell me which one, which denominator you're using. You can also use D lowercase, uh, you can also do this. I was reading something recently and this is the same symbol. Um, I like saying D diff because that tells me what the denominator is versus D av. Um, AVG for averages. I don't think there's a standardized report here, but don't just leave it as D. So for repeated measures, it needs some extra clarification on what denominator you're using. So I can say this is negative, but the negative only tells me the direction I subtracted. Negative 0.96. Okay, we'll come back to this interpretation. We're going to do that exact same thing for FSG high. So there are two t-tests here, so I've got two rows, and I'm making it very clear which one I'm holding constant and which two I'm comparing. Okay. So it's going to be the same comparison, BSG low to BSG high, but now I'm looking at only this FSG group. So that's the purpose of an interaction, is to split things up. That's why I said it's not really a mango split, because we didn't have to split the data set, but it's uh, a split in which I need to really focus in and make sure I'm using the right groups comparison-wise. So it is easier to run. Um, but I think it's a little easier to screw up. So make sure that you know you want, know which groups you're comparing. So for low here, our mean is 64.8. Our standard deviation is 11.88. For high here, mean is 78.45. And our standard deviation here is 10.89. So is a difference of, now this time it's almost 14 points significant. If six points was significant, 14 is probably gonna be significant too, but we tested that. Okay. That's this spot here. Okay. Our D difference score is 1.29. All right, so our interpretation. This has no control for type 1 error. Okay. So one problem with running these tests sort of manually is like I didn't really control for type 1 error. Now with two tests, most people are like, eh, whatever. Um, because two tests, you're probably not going to inflate. You're, it, most type 1 error is inflated at 0.14. But let's say you meet the... Um, the anal retentive research scientist who says that you need to control for type 1 error, what you can do is you can manually run a Bonferroni. Okay. We did this in the uh, double between subjects as well. I remember Bonferroni's formula is alpha. That's the thing we set, where we normally set this to be less than 0.05, divided by the number of comparisons. And in this particular case, that would be 0.05. 0.04. 0.05 divided by 2, which is 0.025. Okay. And what that means is I would compare my p-value to 
two, five. So I'm look here, point, less than 0 0.01, less than 0 0.01, so I would say this is significant. And this one is also significant. So even after controlling for type one error, they're both still significant. Okay. Um, but in the theme of talking about practical versus statistical significance, which is really important, are these practically significant? So they're statistically significant even after controlling for type one error, but are they practically important? And I would argue, yeah, these are very are large effect sizes. Okay. My ADA's, my ADA values were pretty large, <coughs> and then the effect sizes were pretty large. Is that necessary? She's excited about the large effect sizes. All right, after some significant dog head pets, I think we're back. So uh, we were talking about the effect sizes. Are they large? Yes. Is this practically important? I would argue yes. Now, one thing that I tend to get asked, let's go back up to our gigantic picture here. So I'm gonna just click on the picture. I'm just gonna make the whole thing smaller um, because it's currently a huge picture. <clears throat> And then it's gonna disappear, there we go. So we're gonna make a real graph here in a second. So what is the interaction? So interactions, remember, are different patterns across or down. And so what's happening that's creating this significant interaction effect? Because they're both going up. Right? And so often people, when they look at interactions, want one of the effects to not be significant and one of the effects to be significant. So like here, this comparison isn't significant and this one is. That's not what happened in our study. Okay, both of them are significant. And then the issue is that they're both going up. So um, the difference here is positive and the difference here is positive. Um, you know, minus the fact that I subtracted them the other way. Uh, so what is the interaction? To me, the magic happens when you're looking at effect sizes. So if the direction of the effects are the same, meaning it's six it's going up here, so from low to high, it's a six point increase. From low to high here though, it's a 14 point increase. So yes, those are both going up in their ratings, but the effect sizes are, are, are different. Okay. So the effect size for this one is a little smaller. This increase is smaller than this increase. Now, I don't know that I would say that these effect sizes are wildly different, but that interaction is happening because the difference here is smaller than the difference here. Okay. So effect sizes often allow me to interpret interactions in a different way. So if I said they're both going up, people would be like, well, okay, so what's, what is the interaction? The interaction is they're going up differently. So that main point here is that they're changing at different rates. So here the difference is smaller and here the difference is larger. So that's the important part about the interaction. It's very easy to get lost in doing all the button clicking and to say, well, okay, I ran my t-test and they're both significant and be done. But you haven't really interpreted what's going on. Instead, I wanna say, okay, ran my t-test, they're significant. And the fact of the matter is for the interaction is that at low forward strengths, there's only a six point difference. At high forward strengths, there's a 14 point difference. So back to our silly kick it up a notch example, here we're getting a little bump, here we're getting a whole lot of extra spice that maybe we didn't want. So the, the difference here is much larger. All right, so we've covered how to run the assumptions, how to run the test, a little bit of like how to write it up. And I have an example here of what one of those write-ups might look like, um, you know, with all of the different statistics uh, listed out. But what I really wanna do is also include a picture. So I have this picture that here I made an R, so let's look at how we can make this picture in Excel. Let's go back to Excel here. What I wanna do is create my means and standard deviations boxes. Let's make this a little bigger here. So I've got uh, low and high and low and high. And I'm going to just out here to the side label this as forward strengths and this one here as backward strengths. So these are my means. I'm going to do that exact same thing for my standard deviations. 
I'm gonna pull those from over here from Word. If you are on Windows machine, that snap thing will work, just drag it to the side. If you are on a Mac, I highly recommend Better Touch Tool, which allows you to do snap windows as well. <clears throat> All right, so for forward strength low, backward strength low, I've got this 50, 66. For forward strength low, backward strength high, that's this box, I got 56, 34. So we're kind of recreating that comparison we just did. For high, I got 64.8. And for high, high, I've got 78.45. We do the exact same thing, but now with the standard deviation. So I got 12.30. 12.29 going across here. For high, low, I've got 11.88 and 10.89. Except this is going to be a big old typo, so better fix that now. I've got my numbers in place here. Let's highlight everything. So let's try highlighting and seeing if it'll add those um, axes titles for us. It might be a hot disaster, so let's just try it. Oops, no, no, no. Don't want to cut. There we go. I accidentally tried to cut this. So click insert. It's a clustered column graph. Um, that's kind of not quite what we want out here. Um, we can leave it like that, but I don't particularly love that. So what we can do is take that off and try it without the titles. Okay. So we don't have any of that weird title magic happening. So I'm going to delete this chart title. I'm going to delete these lines. We're going to kind of go through the same kind of slow process of cleaning up this graph. So we're going to add chart elements here. Let's add some axis titles, horizontal and vertical here. I think for the legend, we can also add a title. And if not, we'll play with it. But we're going to move that legend up and over here and create this whole chart to be a little bit bigger. And we're going to figure out where to stick this legend so that it doesn't interfere with the error bars. So we'll kind of come back to that. Um, and I'm hoping I can add some sort of legend title. So let's see here. Let's see if we click more legend options, what we get here. So show legend, top right, top left, text options, text outline. Hmm, hmm. This looks like it's going to give us a whole lot of options to like make the text look funny or look different but not a whole lot of options to give it a title. All right, if you know a better way to do this, I will certainly take the hint, but right now I'm not seeing anything. So we'll come back to that. And we can always manually add something here. Now, what's happening is that the legend, since I have to kind of pay attention here, I've got my 50 compared to my 56, and I don't know what I'm, trying to get this to where I can see the means at the same time. Sorry about that. Um, I want to make sure that I've got them set up correctly. So I could switch my rows and columns. And I think that looks more right. So I want 50 compared to 56 and 64 compared to 68, which that looks more like what's happening in this version versus if I hit select row column and flip it in that version. And the reason I want to do those pairs together is because those are the actual comparisons that I made. So I compare these two to each other and these two to each other. We cover this in the graph section. I always want to put the, the bars together how I split it. Um, that's not really a requirement per se, but it does help the reader follow along with what you're doing. Okay. Now, what I might do, since so I can see which one is which, is just add a quick thing here. So that does put forward strength on the bottom axis. Um, so I could uh, change that here. Forward strength. Just because in this particular example, the labels are the same. Now up here, I want to add a, 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 some sort of legend label to denote that this is backward strength. Um, 
the first thing I'm gonna do is add my error bar so that I know how to stick where to stick the label. So we're gonna we're gonna save that kind of for last. This axis title here is average rating, right? Because that's our dependent variable. Let us force this axis. So format axis, right click format axis to go from zero to 100 because that is the range of the possible data points. And then let's play with some of our other features that we tend to fix. So I'm gonna click on the paint bucket and make it a solid line. For some reason, blue is its favorite option, so pick black. I'm gonna do the same thing here. Click down here on the low and high. Click solid line, so it'll be black. Now I have my nice pretty Y axes. Okay. Select the whole chart. Change that bad boy to be Times New Roman. 12, just to make it big enough to see. And then the last thing I wanna add is my error bars. So I'm gonna click on these blue ones here and see how it's highlighting going down. So pay attention to the highlighting over here. And we want to click on chart design, add chart element, error bars, Let's click more error bar options, click custom, specify value. Now I'm gonna highlight going down. Okay. I swear I fixed that to be an 11. Okay, we're gonna fix that in just a second. Click here. Highlight going down. Okay. Remember those two things need to be the same. Click OK. okay. And that looks really wrong because it is. Okay. Thought I'd fix that. Now that looks more appropriate. Click on the orange bars here. I'm gonna do the same thing. So chart design. Add chart element. Error bars. More error bar options. Click custom. Specify value, highlight the standard deviations, click here again, highlight these standard deviations one more time. Remember they should be different than the ones you just did and they should be the same here. So don't highlight one column and then the second column. Okay, so those look nice. Okay, if they're lopsided, you've done something wrong. So if the bar is like really big on top and skinny down below, short down below, that's when you've highlighted the wrong thing. Okay. And now that we can kind of know how much space we have, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a legend, uh, legend title. Because okay. I don't really see that under any of the options here. And we didn't really see it here under any of our options that I can find, is to give us a title, right? I can tell it where to go. And I can change the way it looks, but I don't seem to be able to give it a title, um, which is unfortunate because I don't really wanna call this BSG low, BSG high. I want to just say low versus high and then I just have the label. This is the BSG variable. So I'm gonna insert a text box. I'm just gonna put it right here on top of the chart. And just say BSG. Then I gotta make the whole thing times New Roman again because of course, even if you set your default as, Cali as times New Roman, it just makes things in Calibri just to annoy you. And so now I have the variable as BSG low and high, low and high. Okay. I mean, I could work on making that look like lined up a little better, but I have all the relevant information on the graph. Um, I could also make sure that my text is all in black because it looked like different shades of gray. And then I can work on making the charts not be Auburn colors. Click there's low and high. And so this graph would be more appropriate for publication. I'm gonna copy my graph, I'm gonna paste it into Word over here, and I'm gonna hopefully not have to do too much shenanigans to it. So this is an example of a different type of graph. So I'm gonna get rid of that one, that one's from R. Okay. I'm gonna paste, keep source formatting, so it'll paste correctly, there we go. And then also helpfully added a uh, line around it, cause you know, I wanted that. So we're gonna click here, no outline. 
So three fourths of what we've done is just like formatting <laughs> to be what you want it to be. I've got a figure caption here, but I also want to add error bars denote one standard deviation around the mean, because that's what we did. Except spelling, spelling probably important. There we go. Okay, so we've gotten through all of our analyses, graphs, write-ups, etc. Now, one thing we haven't covered is power. So let's look at G power here. If I go, if you go all the way back up to the top, you'll find some stuff here. Here's power, and gives you an example of what we're about to do. Yep. Under here, we're going to click F test. This is a weird one, so it's repeated measures within factors. We're going to determine an effect size. So all of our effects were actually really large. Um, but let's go with a small effect size because that's what I did in this example. So click Determine, Direct, well, let's say 0.01 for small effect, Calculate and Transfer to Main. Okay, so that's switched over here. Alpha is 0.05, Power is 0.8. Uh, the number of groups here is a little weird because we don't really have groups per se, right? We have conditions. So we're going to go with the number of IVs. The number of measurements is either the number of levels or the number of conditions. So in this particular case, it's two IVs and four conditions, which is the default. That's just um, because the kind of the smallest thing that you can have is a two by two. A correlation among repeated measures here. Remember that's we've talked about this with the single repeated measures. I could estimate that from previous research. I could look at correlations in a pilot study and go with the lowest one that I find. I could leave it as 0.5 to 0.7. In our particular case, we're going to estimate it as pretty high, so 0.9, because we know that previously studies have found very high correlations. And I'm going to leave non-sparsity correction alone, because in a 2x2, two two, I don't have to correct for sparsity. Okay, I'm going to hit Enter. So even with a small effect size, I only need 30 people. Okay. Our actual effect size here was quite large, so I'm going to click Direct. Let's just change that to 0.3, because that's about what we found. Calculate and transfer to main. I hit calculate again. Now it says I only need four people. So when I went from a small effect, I needed 30, to a large effect, I need four. So remember that 30 is kind of the magic number for normality. So I would probably stick with 30 no matter what. Um, uh, but that's a testament to repeated measures, how much power it has because it allows us to find the effect with a much smaller sample size, if the effect is real, um, because it helps us control for the peopleness factor. So it's controlling for, for error, but um, the participants' error terms, uh, which makes it a lot easier to find the effects that we're looking for. Okay. So complete with dog barks in this video, we have covered everything from um, assumptions, testing, and Excel through running the test, poke talk test, effect size, writing this up, uh, making a chart in Excel, and power.